Hello and welcome to the proclamation of the word and the sermon for Good Samaritan Presbyterian Church on the Sunday of June 20th, 2021. Glad that you could join us to hear and to learn from and listen for the Holy Spirit. The scripture reading for today is 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 41 through 49. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. And I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Here ends the reading from God's holy word. So, it's pretty safe to say that everyone knows the story of David and Goliath, whether you were a Sunday school kid or whether you didn't really even go to church at all, you know story of David and Goliath, you, you know what it means, right? It's a, the underdog story, the, the young shepherd boy with no armor and nothing but smooth stones that the Lord instructed him to gather in the wadi, goes out with his, his sling and with a either a very lucky or a divinely inspired or perhaps a, or a skillful or perhaps maybe a mixture of all of those three, hits Goliath in the forehead and the Philistine, who who was nine feet tall and whose whose spear was was like an oak tree, he was down. Thing is, though, that that's the metaphor that we use. A David, a David slays Goliath means the, the the small, weak one who is not supposed to win comes out victorious. And, and we use that we use that as the the metaphor, but that's Honestly, that's not what the story says. David is, is no underdog. David, David, yes, David, is a young man, not, not really even full grown yet. He can't wear the armor that Saul tries to put on him to go out and fight the Philistine. And Goliath was huge and strong. I mean, it's, it's hard to, to figure exactly how big Goliath is. I mean, you know, we, it, a lot of this gets sort of inflated in, in the telling of stories. But, but he has a bunch of oppressive armor. He's got shield bearers. He's got swords. He's got all the stuff that you need to fight a battle, and David has none of that. But still, David is no underdog. David knows he's no underdog. He tells Goliath that he has something on his side that is better than armor. He has the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is in Israel. And he also has a ranged weapon, which, which is a big plus. You know, I mean, that's, that's the farther off you get from your enemy, especially if the enemy is bigger and stronger than you. Being able to hit them from a distance is absolutely a tactical advantage that perhaps Goliath didn't fully appreciate. Is while being gigantic and strong and fearsome, he apparently wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer distance attacks always give you a tactical advantage though 
I mean, the, the, the Mongol hordes, one, their, their big innovation was bows that were short enough to be able to be, to be shot accurately while riding on horseback. To this day, our most fearsome weapons are the ones that we can deploy from half a world away or even in, in low orbit. <laughs> the, these, this tactical advantage that David pioneers here is nothing surprising to anybody. And he knew, David knew from his experience as a shepherd fighting off lions and bears and wolves and things that were superior in strength and armament and of their own sort to a shepherd boy. He knew that the sling was his best ally. It's also the tool he knew how to use. He didn't know how to use a sword. He didn't really know anything about combat. He knew about protecting his flock from wild animals. But the real kicker is always, always, and David knows this, that God is on his side. And how do we know that he had God on his side? Well, quite frankly, because he won. <laughs> That's really all the evidence we have. I mean, honestly, we have the stories about, about Samuel anointing David and all, and all that kind of thing. But if, from the Philistines' perspective, the only thing that, that would really prove that, that there is a God in Israel is David's victory. The old adage is, the history is written by the winners. And that is, unfortunately, for better or worse, true of the Bible as well. One of the things that, that George Martin did very well in his novels, the, the, the Song of Ice and Fire that was made into the TV series Game of Thrones, is work through the ramifications of kings. And, and it's called Game of Thrones because it's all about the people who are trying to rule and their, their machinations and their campaigns and their betrayals and their backstabbing and their foibles. But one of the interesting things in, in, in his telling of the story is he, he toys around and explores the idea that it seems like the, the kings of the past who won great victories and ruled great kingdoms um, they, they all, everybody comes to see them in the course of time as almost like godlike figures, and and the, all of their accomplishments are, are are ascribed to them being divinely chosen, divinely sh sanctioned, given you know by whatever <laughs> they, they've got a lot more gods in in the stories than we do, but they 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 are put where they are, and they rule and they they ones in the past seem like they have something special about them. But at the same time, the, the kings, the rulers, and the pretenders of the moment always seem to be, well, somewhat more of a disappointment. <laughs> and that is, you know, a very biblical thing. It is, it is one of the remarkable facets of the history of the Hebrew, that we are told in the Hebrew Scriptures. And, it, and even the history that we see play out later on down the road in, in, in the time, in the age that we know as Christendom. The, it is, it, you know, it's dangerous to snip uh, dramatic incidents out of context and then use them, as we see with David and Goliath, where, where we generally understand that story to be about an underdog, when really it's not about an underdog at all. Uh, to put it in context, shows you something that's a little deeper about how to slay a giant. That's a little deeper than just about how to slay a giant. When you put it in context, it shows you, it actually shows, it's a, it becomes part of a larger commentary on the shortcomings of power that is gained by violence. And I know, that seems weird because it's a story about, about a guy who kills another guy. It's a story that, that includes these threats of like you know not only are we going to kill you we're going to we're going to let the, the the wild animals and the birds pick at your carcasses. Now it's, it's all very all very gruesome. David, Saul, and Samuel are a part of a, a much larger lesson than just this one moment with David and Goliath. Even though this is the, this is the felt board Sunday school lesson moment, right? This, this, this lesson that God is trying to teach his people <laughs> it 
is is very is, is extremely important, but it's not going to be learned easily. It starts it starts well before the story of of David and Saul even gets started, even before Saul is anointed king, even before David comes on the scene at all. He, this God tried to warn Israel about this whole king thing, this this game of thrones that they seem to intent on wanting to play. You know, the famous line from the from the show in the books is you, you, in the game of thrones you, you 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 win or you die. The biblical story is actually in the game of thrones you die whether you win or you lose. You you, you eventually fall because there's some there's a bigger kingdom at stake than in any of the ones that you can imagine. God tried to warn Israel that this would be the case, but where they were at, at their particular point in history, they weren't able to hear that lesson or learn that lesson. God, I mean, the, the, the beginning of Samuel's sort of career as a prophet and the end of his career as a judge is that moment where the Israelites are crying out for a king for a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, some of it is just, well, all the other kids have kings and we want a king too. But... The, but the really the more basic problem that they're experiencing is that it is impossible to get all the tribes to cooperate. It, they they are there is there is deep dysfunction and inner tribal warfare and conflict and anarchy and brutality. This world that this that this story takes place in is just absolutely brutal. And so the people see that, that they need a king. I mean, they do. They, they, they do need a king. It, it, it's, it's not that this world is just too uncertain if you don't have some person who can pull the resources of all the, of all the sons of Abraham together. And they, they, were, they, were not, they, they did not work and play well together. So Samuel and God have a conversation more about that later, but Samuel feels that this is that this is not God's will for the people, and and, and to be fair, it, it it's it's really not God's intention for the people of Israel was always that He would be their God and they would be His people, and that if they needed guidance, they would look to the Spirit of God living in in them and among them and the law that He that it was given to Moses. And, and the community of, of faith that guided them. Because, that, I mean, that's, that's really what the remarkable thing about Israel, right, is, is, is it's not so much a political body. It's not so much a military existence. It's not so much a, 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 a nation in any way, shape, or form, other than the fact that they are united around this one covenant that God has made with them. That's always going to be the thing sets them apart for better, for worse, and everything in between. And this lesson that they have to learn is going to take centuries. The rise and fall of kings and kingdoms, the comings and goings, exiles and the the wanderings. It, it, it doesn't happen overnight because it, it it's just tough. It's tough to see how a kingdom can exist that is not founded on power and violence and greed. They, they don't really ever get it right. We don't ever really get it right as the, the representatives of the body of Christ in the world. But it starts after Samuel and God come to an understanding that, that well, the people aren't going to give up on their desire and the demand for a king, it starts with Saul, a man named Saul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul is picked as to be the king over Israel. He has several things going for him. For him. And the first thing that is mentioned, first thing, you love this, is that he is handsome and tall. 
I, and I don't just mean like he, well, hey, well there's a nice looking fellow. No, he's a smoke show. He is tall, dark, and handsome. And I, I, I'm assuming the dark part because he's Middle Eastern. So probably, yet, you know, not blonde-haired and blue-eyed. He, he, it, that's what it says about him. It says, Saul was better looking than any other dude in all the tribes. Really? That, well, because that's a, well, that's a good criteria, right? Because you want your king to look the part, right? That, that makes, well, kind of makes sense. You know, I mean, it, it's, you, you, the image of a king is important. And it's going to be a lot better for people if they look at Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome out there wearing his flashy armor. They're going to feel like, yeah, you know what, this is the right guy. And, and you know, he was. He was also a fairly capable commander of armies, at least until he started to lose his grip on reality. He won, he won more battles than he lost. He, he was pretty capable in that department. Not, he wasn't a bumbler. Uh, you know, David ends up kind of running circles around him, but that's more because David is, David is a different kind of smart than Saul is. And also, like I said, Saul was starting to lose his grip on reality at that point. But the third thing, the thing that maybe you don't always think about, is this tribal affiliation. He's from Benjamin. Benjamin, you know, one of the... Benjamin, if you remember the, the, the story, Benjamin is one of the two sons of Rachel. Jacob, Joseph and Benjamin were, were Rachel's sons to Jacob. Leah had a whole bunch of other ones. And let's just say their family relationship was a little complicated. Benjamin and Joseph were the favorites of, of Jacob slash Israel. And, and the other boys kind of resented that. They resented Joseph a little more because he was a little more of a loudmouth about it. But, I mean, they ended up you know, beating Joseph up and selling him into slavery. <laughs> that, you know, brotherly love and all. But Benjamin, Benjamin was, you know, they, they decided they, they weren't going to go that way with Benjamin. They, they protected Benjamin. Benjamin was the, he's the baby boy. He was the one that, I, despite the fact that, that he was maybe a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of, of you know, daddy's favorite, he, they, 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 they learned something about their whole drama with Joseph. So Benjamin, Benjamin gets what Benjamin gets, which is not a lot. Benjamin is not a threatening presence. Benjamin is the is like the least of the tribes. So he gets you know tucked into, or so Judah like surrounds him and protects him, so that nobody else can mess with Benjamin. They, they, remember the tribes, the tribes of Israel very much take have, they take on, on very human personalities. So Saul, being from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, is a good middle ground choice for leader because, like, if if you pick somebody from Judah, then then a lot of the the major rivals to Judah, like Ephraim, are going to be like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't trust those Judahites. They're they're they, they're they're always trying to lord it over everybody. They're the biggest and strongest. So so you know that that it's sort of like having major treaty accords done in Switzerland in Geneva. It's a it's a neutral place, or or like you know, the fact that we have Washington D.C. as the seat of the federal government. And it's not a state. It's set aside. It's separate. It, Benjamin, ben, you know, Benjamin actually, Benjamin is kind of like the D.C. of the tribes of Judah. It, and, and so there, there's a political aspect to, Paul's, to Saul's rightness as well. Because the disunity of the tribes was a major source of the outcry for a king in the first place. It wasn't just that all their major antagonists had kings. It was really the fact that they felt like they couldn't hold themselves together, and Samuel couldn't hold them together. None of the other judges seemed to be able to hold them together. And the, the end of the book of Judges is just this bleak story that is full of rape and murder and just despicable behavior, and it, it, and it ends with, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And this is the situation where, where people, were, this is what they, were, what they were crying out against, really, is this this the state of anarchy that the, that the judges had, the era of judges had led them to. And, it, it, you know, if you were really shocked by anything that George Martin put in Game of Thrones or anything that HBO put on their show, you haven't read the end of the, you haven't read the book of Judges and the books of Samuel very, very closely because what they leave out of the Sunday school lessons is decidedly R-rated for sure. 
You probably don't realize from your Sunday school lessons about David and Goliath is that this period of time is just so bloody and brutal. The wars, and tribes and nations, anarchy. And somehow or other God is involved in this mess. And the thing is, you know, they didn't write this history down for centuries. They, they had plenty of chances to clean, up, to clean it up and make it seem better than it was. But they don't. They, they let God take all the responsibility for what is going on. And, and, and I think that goes hand in hand with giving God all the credit for what eventually happened. The, the, they wanted a great, strong king. And Samuel, you know, the, this conversation between God and Samuel, where, you know, I, I, have, to, uh, I have to say that I, th- that I think that, you know, the way that God talks to Samuel is not that terribly different than the way God talks to anyone. It's, it's a conversation that happens within, with, between the Holy Spirit and, and Samuel's spirit. And, it, you know, Samuel is certainly tuned into it in a different way than, than maybe your average bear. But, but he, you know, he, he, from the time he was a young boy, he had moments where he, where he heard God's voice very clearly. And so Samuel, his gift is that he's tuned in to what God is doing. But he also is a human being who doesn't always get it right. Understand? So he picks Saul because it seems, Saul seems like the right person. He's handsome, he's tall, he's good, you know, he's, he can fight some battles. And, and it seems like a good choice, but Saul also is unstable. He becomes, you know, arrogant, paranoid. Uh, you know, it says God sent a, a lying spirit to torment him, which, you know, basically in, in real life language means he just went crazy from the stress. <laughs> you know, he he... he could not believe that he was strong enough. He could not believe that, that, that he really could unite these people. So he started to, to go over the edge. And David is his biggest threat, the slayer of Goliath. And the, it's the good soldier and the lute player that, that soothes his spirit. You know, with, within a couple verses of, of David slaying Goliath, you have... Saul being threatened by this young, not even full-grown man yet, and trying to throw a spear at him and pin him to the wall. David was also light on his feet, you know. <laughs> he not only got their first king, Israel, they got their first mad king. It usually takes, you know, at least a couple generations of, of, little, of little too close inbreeding or, or, you know, some severe trauma for monarchs to get to that point. But Israel gets it right in the very first couple years. They're, they're moving things along. <laughs> so enter David, from one of Jesse from Bethlehem's younger son. David is, is in a lot of ways, uh, a, a contrast to Saul. He's, he's, he's good looking too, but in a different kind of way. It says he's ruddy and handsome, which is, means, you know, where Saul is like, you know, intense, you know, Mr. Smoke Show David. David is like, oh, there's a, he's, he looks like such a good, clean cut boy. And David doesn't have the same edge to him that Saul does. David, David is prone to, David is, is in addition to being a, a warrior and a soldier, he's also a musician and a poet. David's got, David's got what they might call a sensitive side, right? Saul, Saul is all about power. And David is different. He, he, he's not perfect, as we're going to see, but... but He's a contrast to Saul. Samuel has learned some lessons by the time it come, by the time it's clear that Saul is failing. He hears God's criteria a little clearer this time. He, he knows God sends him maybe to you know this time it's not maybe it's not the safest tribe, but maybe we should unite behind the strongest tribe, Judah. That's where that's where David comes from, Bethlehem in the, in the tribe of Judah. That's that's his lineage. Um, so so it's not it's not trying to pick the middle ground that's going to keep everybody happy. It's going to get we're going to get behind the one who really can represent the strength of Israel. 
David, David's not going to have to try quite so hard to unite the tribes because he's going to be something pretty special. But, you know, it, it also part of it is, you know, maybe we shouldn't pick the biggest ego in the room. <laughs> maybe we should pick somebody who, who has some, who does have some doubts about themselves and who is willing to confess their sins. David isn't perfect, but, he, but he's teachable. You know, I think that's, that's the real difference between, between Saul and David, is that Saul is already, he's a finished product. And the only way, to, only, only way to go for Saul is down. David is still moldable. He, and he, is, he also proves that he is capable of hearing the voice of God the way Samuel hears the voice of God. Which, which means also that sometimes he can get it wrong. He starts out super well. <laughs> he survives Saul's persecutions and being on the run, and he develops, you know, a, a, a strong friendship with, with Saul's son Jonathan, and ends up marrying one of Saul's daughters. And you know, they, they, they 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 do the the royalty thing where they merge families. Saul still ends up trying to murder him. <laughs> David though becomes a, a better king than Saul. He lasts longer, at least. But eventually, as he sinks into the, the lure and the trappings of power, he, he ends up not being quite everything that you might hope he would be. Just, just ask Uriah the Hittite. The lesson we see in Scripture through all of this is that God manages, and I would, you might even say learns, though when we say that God learned something, that, that, that brings a whole bunch of theological trouble into the picture. But I, I'm willing to go that far. If not God, God himself, at least our idea of God, our understanding of God grows to the point where we realize that God is able to work with humans as they are. That's a remarkable religious insight for especially for this for the time when this was being lived out and the time when it was being written down and the cent- even the centuries that, that we've studied it. it it's you know God is is not as able to work with us including our, our our imperfect ability to actually listen to what the Holy Spirit is doing and that and that's the, that's the thing where I, I kept putting like Samuel, heard God's voice or David, you know, had, you know, understood what God wanted. I, I really feel like, you know, that, that it's, it's not that God like had this totally different mode of communication with people back then that, than God has now. You know, I, I think that, that there, there's, there are always moments when we can hear the voice of God, but they're not the usual conversations. They're not the usual ways that God communicates. It's not always... This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased coming out of a, a cloud of, and sounding like thunder. It's not always, you know, Moses up on the mountain in the clouds and thick dark, darkness receiving the Ten Commandments. A lot of times, our ability to hear God really depends on how quiet we can make our own souls and all the static that comes with our lives. And, and, and it's not always perfect. It's not, it's not perfect for, for Samuel. It's not perfect for David. It's not perfect for, for, for any of the disciples. And I would even say it's, it, it's not always even perfectly clear for Jesus. He, he, is, he needs time to go away and, and hear the voice of God and to, and to pray. Like that, that shows me that this communication with God is a little more complicated than just well, God said to Samuel, or God said to Moses. It takes a little bit more work, but it's necessary work. That's you know that that's why that's why prophets have to do what prophets have to do. It, you know, they have to to learn to hear what God is doing. Listen for that guidance. Carefully discern what God wants, and sometimes make mistakes. Sometimes go the wrong way. Sometimes pick Saul. Right up. It looks like the right guy. Seems like the right guy. Everything about Saul just shouted king. But he wasn't. He was a 
wasn't the right choice. Again, you know, it says God mourned that he had chosen Saul. That's, that's, what, that's what it says. So, this connects. This connects to the, the whole story. And, and you know, you, you've probably heard me do stuff like this before, but you need... I, I really feel that, that one of the one of the most helpful things that we can do when it comes to trying to interpret Scripture is seeing how it fits into what the whole of Scripture says. It's not always the best way to understand one thing or another thing, but to, to take pieces and put them really in context. The this connects to how we understand the kingdom of God coming into the world. And you need to, to know that there's this, this, this history of right choice, wrong choice, good king, bad king. <clears throat> you know, we're living, in, we're living according to, in a way that pleases the Lord and then you know, not living in a way that pleases the Lord. And how that history twists and turns and rises and falls and goes all over the place until you get to the point where Jesus comes along. Jesus is doing something different. And everybody is, is, is trying to understand what, it, what exactly it is that's different about Jesus. His own disciples are trying to figure it out. <coughs> and that is illustrated in the story that is the gospel reading for this morning. Uh, it, it is the, the story of Jesus crossing the, the Sea of Galilee in, in, in the middle of the storm with his disciples and they're all starting to panic about the storm and Jesus is sleeping, taking a sweet, sweet nap in the, in the stern of the boat. And then they're, they're, they're like, uh, uh, wake him up and they're like, Jesus, Jesus, there's a storm. Don't you even care? Like, you know, it's all hands on deck, man. We've we got we to fight for our lives here. <laughs> he says, do you still not have faith. And he's not just talking about the things that they've learned since they've been traveling around with him. He's talking about their whole history. They're so worried about the storm. They're so worried about the, the immediate danger. They, they, they want to, to solve the problem that's right in front of their nose. Like they, they want, they, they're, they're, again, they're crying out for a king. The same, it's the same thing, the turmoil around them gets to them and they're, they're not calm and they're not trusting and they're, they're, they're not able to, to just simply know that God is going to see them through. It's too much. It's Jesus says, all right, storm, knock it off. And he doesn't get to the other side and drop them off and get a whole new set of disciples that might be better. No. He continues to work with the broken, messed up ones whose faith fails them at the worst possible time. This should be maybe a little bit insulting to those of us who are disciples of Jesus to know that, that we follow a Lord who will challenge us to face giants and storms. And, and also question whether we really even get a little bit of what's going on. But it's also comforting. You know, God is not waiting for you to be your best self before calling you his beloved child. God is not holding back the kingdom until we get it right. God is not waiting anxiously in the wings of history for us to somehow cross some magical threshold where we're finally ready. God is making things happen here and now. And some of us will be ready for those things and some of us won't. <laughs> the reason Jesus seems a little curt with his disciples is because as part of the people that, that share this sort of narrative history of God called bringing people out of slavery and God rescuing people and God making kingdoms rise and fall and seeing the, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians come and go, they still 
tend to worry about the storm that is right in front of their face. And they really should know better than to freak out about the storm. They're, they're still amazed at the power that God can exercise. Their idea of God is a fairly typical distortion that we tend to have. That the, the, doing the will of God means smooth sailing, that we're always going to be victorious and that we're always going to be lifted up. When, and, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with the narrative, narrative history of Scripture, where did we ever get that idea? It, was, it, wasn't, from, it wasn't from the Hebrews in their story. They're, they're not from the, the disciples' experiences with Jesus. When they remembered this story, just as when the Hebrews remembered Saul and David, they were reminded that God is present with them even when their faith and their courage fail. We, we should keep that in mind before we start getting arrogant about what it means to say that God is on our side. God can change sides. He was on Saul's side, and he became on David's side. He, he was on the side of, of the kingdom for a while, and then not on their side. He, he was with the people in exile. He was always there. The people, their understanding of it changes. It shifts like sand. And it, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why God chooses to be that unpredictable. Because God never guarantees that we win. God never guarantees that we get to write history. God never guarantees that, that Goliath isn't going to take a few battles here and there. In fact, when, 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 if we're trying to judge our, the rightness of where we are, it means that, that we should find ourselves in a place where the Goliaths of the world, the ones who rule by power and fear and violence, they, they should look at the servants of the Most High and they should laugh at them. They, 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 they should look at David with his sling the same way that the, 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 the wielders of intercontinental missiles look at people who insist upon nonviolence. They might think that they're not much of a threat. They might think that they don't stand a chance, but they are wielding the power of God. They think our threat to them is absurd. They think that the meek will not truly inherit the earth. They don't. They, all they see is the storm. We need as the church, to stick to the smooth stones that God has told us to find and not try to put on armor that doesn't fit. When we put on armor that tries to, to, to hold power, power that, that, that comes with fear and power that is wielded in, in violent ways, we are, we are not following the Lord. We are not following the God who is in Israel. We are not following the God who told Samuel to anoint David. We are not following the God who brings order out of chaos. We're serving something else. We, we don't have the perfect weapons for every fight. We need to find them, but we always need to understand that they, they are not the things that we necessarily think they are. Before we get arrogant about what it means to say that God is on our side, we need to spend enough time listening to, for the voice of God so that we really know that is true. And it's not just something that we made up out of our own desires for a king or out of our own desire to hold on to what we have. Sometimes, a 
lot of the time. Maybe even all the time. Following God means laying down what you think you want and picking up what God tells you you need. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for the wisdom and the faith to see through the storm. To see that that your presence with us is as real as Jesus sleeping in the bow of the boat. It is as powerful for us as the stones that David was told to gather. It may not look like much to those who wield terrible, violent power in the world. But they are no threat to us because we serve a kingdom that is greater than theirs. There is nothing that the principalities and the powers can offer us that Jesus cannot simply still with a word. There is nothing that we need to fear in heaven and earth because we are welcome in your kingdom. The grace of your kingdom surrounds us. The faith and the love and the hope that we have in the resurrection holds us fast no matter what. So, Lord, we we pray that as we move through this world, whether the storms are raging or the waters are smooth, that we would understand that you are with us always to the close of the age. Help us to live in that faith, the faith that is willing to go out vulnerable against a Goliath, that is willing to, to... put that absolute trust in what you are doing and knowing that when we do that we even though we may seem like it we are not in fact underdogs we are we are indeed going with a greater force than all the violence that the world can imagine can can bring together we are able to go through the midst of that storm without fear. So let us live in that hope and and let that hope in fact set us free from all the things that would send us cowering back into the darkness and the paranoia that afflicted Saul. Let us be always people who Listen for your word, even when we don't hear it perfectly. Who seek your face, even when we see only through a glass darkly. Let us be people who are willing and courageous enough to live, to love, and to act for justice, mercy, and steadfast love. The only way we come to that place, Lord, is by the breath of your Holy Spirit giving us what we need to get there. And so, by that Spirit, we put ourselves in your hands and we ask, Lord, that you would hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you're going, God is sending you. Wherever you are now, he has a reason for you to be there. Jesus Christ, who lives in you, has something he wants you to do right here right now, where you are. Believe this. Go in his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power. God's people said,